Hello and welcome to Money Matters TV. My name is Michael Vero and I am the Vice President of Strategic Development with the Sharp Financial Group. We provide a system of integrated financial management to help entrepreneurs maximize business value, increase cash flow, reduce tax liability, and plan the transition for the most valuable asset for, for long-term family wealth and future legacy. Thank you for joining us for our continuing discussion on growth stories, where we hear from entrepreneurs and advisors who share secrets and advice on what business owners need to know to grow. From time to time, issues involving health sciences, life sciences, technology companies may be discussed on this show. Those discussions are not and should not be viewed as financial advice. Moreover, since the program is pre-recorded and shown at a later date, some of the discussion may no longer be relevant. You should always check with your financial advisor before entering into any financial transaction. I'm joined by my co-host, Rhea Bears, Vice President with CBRE, a global real estate consulting firm. Ms. Bears has spent the last 15 years focusing on research and consulting for corporate occupiers of space. She heads up the technology and media practice where she focuses on high growth technology companies to help develop real estate strategies to support their business objectives. She also serves on the program development and outreach committees for Tech Girls, an organization that helps expose middle school age girls to careers in technology. Hello, Rhea, it's great to see you. Hi, Mike, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Great, um, can you give me an update on some of the things you've been working on since we last met? Sure, I just came back from a conference in New York. It's our CBRE Technology and Media Conference. Um, we were there with a lot of CEOs of tech companies as well as venture capital um, backers and just were talking to them about changing workplace. Um, the other thing is WeWork came in and spoke with us about their new enterprise solutions. Um, and then just generally speaking about uh, commercial real estate disruptors, the most interesting of which is the autonomous or driverless cars and how that's going to impact the real estate. Great. So that was the one thing that really stuck out and surprised you. What, what, is, what are some of the things they're saying on how that might impact? Yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting. First, it's coming a lot quicker than we think. Um, it'll be happening in the next couple of years. Okay. Um, that was first and foremost. And then um, it's really just going to change liability um, from really us as drivers and shift it onto the automakers. So that's going to be an interesting shift that will disrupt not only commercial real estate, but the insurance industry as yeah, well. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, I guess we'll wait and see how that yeah. plays out. That's right. Um, before we introduce our guests, we mm -hmm. have a question from one of our viewers. Okay. Uh, Nancy Marks from Philadelphia would like to know, is there a downturn coming in the Philadelphia real estate market? Uh, can we expect one? Sure. Um, so we have been in the longest expansionary period. Um, in modern history, and um, it's been a great economy. Um, suburban Philadelphia just finished up its best quarter in 12 years. Um, Center City is lagging behind a little bit, but I think when we're going to see the contraction start is in 2019. But this time, we're not looking at um, a correction that's many more than a couple years long okay. that differs from the last one. Well, hopefully it won't feel as bad as the last one, so yeah. that's good. And we have a couple of years till it happens. So. That's right. Agreed. I always see real estate as a kind of a leading indicator uh, of uh, of a cor of a economic downturn. Is that what you typically see? Yeah, we usually see that's where it starts first. You see the pullback and austerity measures come into place, um, and then it usually comes and hits the housing market right, next. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. okay. Well, we'll keep an eye on that. Great. It's always great to hear from our viewers. Uh, to send uh, information for a future show, here's how to send your questions to Money Matters TV. You can have your questions answered on Money Matters. Please go to our website, money-matterstv.com. On our homepage, click on the banner on the right that says, Send Us Your Questions. While you're on our website, you can find information about our hosts and guests, as well as show notes and links about this show and past shows. Money Matters is also available as a podcast on iTunes and Stitcher, so you can listen to Money Matters while you're on the go. That website address, again, is money, M-O-N-E-Y, dash matters, M-A-T-T-E-R-S-T-V dot com. Too impatient to wait to climb the corporate ladder to success, driven by his passion for technology and driven by his... Uh, desire to continue to search out better ways to get things done. It is my pleasure to welcome our guest, John Weidenhammer of Weidenhammer, CEO of Weidenhammer. 
John, Rhea and I are happy to have you here on Money Matters TV and our segment Growth Stories. Uh, before we get started, can you give the viewers an overview of Widenhammer and what your company does? Sure. Uh, and by the way, I'm delighted to be here with you, Michael and Rhea. It's so great to have a chance to spend the afternoon with you. So, um, Widenhammer is an information technology company at its heart, but the real thing that we do is we help our clients transform and accelerate their business to be more competitive in an increasingly global and digitally connected world. That's, That's great. great. Um, and Mike was saying that you were climbing the corporate ladder, and we talked earlier about the fact that you hit a little bit of a roadblock based on number of years experience versus your skill set. How did that drive you to start Widenhammer, and how do you handle that now in your own company? Well, I think the story you're referring to is when I first got out of college, I, you know, of course, was a 20-something and working for a steel company. and. We had built some really amazing production management mm -hmm. technology that got deployed and it was really one of the first online real-time uh, systems in the steel industry to manage production in the plant. And uh, the system was so successful that my boss ultimately got promoted to be the uh, assistant to the vi vice president of manufacturing of this uh, the manufacturing company. And for a long time, the manager of the IT department position was open. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I was meeting with uh, the CFO of the company who kind of was filling in. And uh, uh, I said, you know, we really need a manager for this department. And he said, you're absolutely right. And I said, I think it ought to be me. <laughs> and he said, you're right about that too. Uh, so I said, great, well, so when do we start? And he said, you know, John, I've run this up the flagpole with management and HR and just somebody at your age would be by far the youngest person to be on the management payroll and they're just not going to do it. And he said, I've been dreading having this conversation with you, but it's not going to happen. So really within you know, just a few days, uh, one of my peers got promoted to be the manager of the, of the department and, uh, you know, I was disappointed and started looking around the company and realized that kind of anybody who was anybody had been there 20 years and I just didn't want to wait that long to have mm -hmm. my chance to, you know, move into management and have a more senior uh, p position. And uh, so, uh, remarkably, I guess, or serendipity maybe, is uh, I played uh, basketball in a city basketball league with a colleague of mine who had been on the project team building this system mm -hmm. I, I talked about. And uh, he and I actually had gone to graduate school together. We commuted back and forth to, uh, to Lehigh. And uh, we were taking our shoes off uh, one day after a game, and he says he had left to go to work for uh, a company that was then called Ernst & Ernst, now Ernst & Young. And he asked me if I'd be interested in uh, a position on their consulting team. And I told him that I would be, and in a short period of time, uh, I got a call from the manager of the practice, and you know, I guess the rest, as they say, is history. I took mm -hmm. the job and you know, left. Uh, Carpenter, uh, which is where I had worked after college, to uh, to go to Ernst and Young. It's interesting because I think uh, millennials today get accused of you know being too uh, interested in moving to the next level, but maybe it's just go getters, right? That's kind of happened at every. Do you experience that with millennials, or how do you deal with that? In the yeah, yeah, workplace? we 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 do. I think that, um, and, and this is painting with way of a broad brush. Sure. So sure. For those out there, yeah, for, for those millennials, we're <laughs> just stuck in a box. For, for, apologies. For, for, right. Forgive me, but um, I, I do think that young people have a greater sense of their need to explore many opportunities in a career than perhaps you know my uh, generation or even my parents' you know generation. I, my father worked for the same company. Uh, uh, Dana Corporation for literally his whole his whole uh, career, mm -hmm. and I think today a lot of younger people come to the job with the expectation that the job is really about enabling them to live rather than the job is kind of you know ev everything. And you know I think uh, today's workforce is a little bit more uh, focused on life balance and. Um, you know things that happen to them outside of work. You know, I often tell my team when I when I worked for Ernst and Young, if my boss said, you know, hey, you're going to be working on a project in California for the next six months, I wouldn't have questioned it. I would say, well, you know, where's the airline ticket? You know, when when do we start? Mm -hmm. You know, today if you did that, people would say, oh, you're killing me. You know, <laughs> I'm involved in the PTA. I'm coaching my kids' right. team. You know, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Right. It would really be a hardship 
for me to do that. In fact, when, uh, and, and when I know you want to talk about this, but when Weidenhammer first got started, because of my background working for an international consulting firm, early on our practice really was about, it was you know kind of global mm -hmm. in, in scope because of what I knew and how I had worked. And as we went through uh, time, it became increasingly difficult to get our team to want to work long term on assignments that were, we'll call it away, away from home. And despite the fact that we tried increasing salaries, giving people battle pay, you know, really mm -hmm. making it financially worthwhile, a lot of folks would come and say, you know, John, it's not about the money. Right. It's, a, yeah. it's a lifestyle right. issue. You know, it's just, it's just a problem for me when I'm away from home all the time. And I, I experienced that. I mean, it's difficult when you're a road squad consultant, as I was with uh, Ernst & Young, that, uh, you know, you leave on uh, Monday or Sunday night, you get back on uh, Friday night or Saturday morning, and, you know, of course, your family has all these things that they want you to do, and right. you've been out to dinner every night. All you want to do is kind of sit in a chair and you know, right. drink drink a beer, but right. you got to, you know, get your hair cut, go see your parents, see your in-laws, you know, uh, cut the grass and, you know, do all that, all that, <laughs> right. all right. that kind of thing. And, you know, it's, it, it really creates, I think, uh, stress, mm -hmm. really, in your, uh, in your life. So, at Weidenheimer, how did you compete with uh, some of the, I'm assuming you were competing with some of the Ernst and Youngs and things. We were. You know that. And we so were. So, how do you compete? Because they can, there's an expectation for the talent going there that that's going to be the environment, but you're going to be hiring talent that maybe wants to stay closer to home and doesn't want to work for that big firm. How do you compete? It, 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 it is. Well, you, you compete through the talent. You compete through your smarts. And we were able, I, I remember many times competing, especially with Arthur Anderson and company mm -hmm. before Accenture came along. And often my team would be very intimidated by them. And I would say, you know, Hey, they're no different than us. You right. know, the, the only difference is they get paid twice as much as we, <laughs> as we do. But, you know, we put our socks on the same way they do, mm -hmm. and we're just as smart as they are. And we graduated from the same colleges as they did. And in, and in many cases, we're a lot more agile. We're more efficient, and we can do a better job. And I, I can't, it, this didn't happen every time, but I can't tell you the number of times when we would work side by side with one of the, at the time they were called the big eight public accounting firms mm -hmm. and even IBM and others. Uh, and, um, you know, our clients invariably would come around to recognizing that we represented a, a better value. I mean, you yeah. know, I, 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 I can remember times when we either weren't hired or we were excused because a client just wasn't comfortable taking a risk on a small firm like Widenhammer. I can mm -hmm. remember a couple circumstances where, they, I mean, they almost came to us apologetically and said, you mm -hmm. know, our senior management just thinks we need a big name. Right. You know, it's right. the old story, you know, that we used to say, you know, years ago, nobody ever got fired for hi hiring IBM or buying, you know, IBM right. equipment. And I think the same thing was true of, you know, there, there's almost a presumption that, um, the uh, the bigger firms have smarter people. In fact, I, I know when I was <laughs> working in the consulting business, the, uh, we used to have the phrase, the guy from more than 50 miles away from home is always smarter <laughs> than the guys from right here. Right in the backyard. So part of our, uh, 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 I won't say a trick, but the thing that we used to do was we would have somebody from halfway across the, the country fly in, and I was right. often that guy. <laughs> right. And right. they'd say, here's our expert. Right. Right. And the only thing I knew was what they had briefed me on on the way from, <laughs> <laughs> the, way from the airport. Uh, and but your plane ticket cost more. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. exactly. But, you know, there is, you know, we have that mental link that, you know, uh, it's like in healthcare. You know, mm -hmm. you assume that the doctors who... Uh, work in Center City are smarter and more capable than the doctors that you know are out in the in the suburbs. You know why is that? You know, we don't know. We think that the people from the power centers or from the big uh, companies are just inherently smarter. Mm -hmm. You know, is it is it the case? We found in in the case of you know White and Hammer as a startup that we could do the work, we could provide the the solutions and be very competitive, especially be competitive on uh, on on price. And, and I know a lot of times it wasn't just about about price. So you obviously have to be a little bit scrappy and, and willing to take some risks uh, to go up against the big guys starting a company like that. Um, what Can you give us a little bit of insight into your background? Where did you grow up? What was your family life like? Are the things that you learned early on that 
gave you that confidence and sense of yourself that would made you able to be able to do that? Sure. I, I grew up in the city of Reading, a, a very super middle class family. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say uh, I have two older, two older brothers. My mother was uh, very much a dedicated uh, housewife and her life revolved around her her children my dad was a uh, uh, mid-level supervisor in a uh, a car frame manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, plant I mean, we don't even have car frames uh, today I guess trucks still have frames right. but yeah. you know back then they made you know th thousands of ca car frames at this factory uh, but very very happy childhood we laughed all the all the the, the time uh, and uh, in fact, I, I think I uh, told you this in our, our briefing, um, you know, while a lot of families maybe at the dinner table would have uh, said grace or said, mm -hmm. a, said a prayer in our family, we told a joke. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you if, if you didn't come prepared to tell a joke uh, at dinner time, we had this book, 10,001 Jokes. Uh, would, you know, you get handed the book and most, most of the jokes were pretty silly or they were riddles. Uh, but, you know, so, um, I, I think I was destined to be kind of an entrepreneur and kind of knew that. I was always the kind of guy that had a paper route or a lemonade stand mm -hmm. or was selling something door to door to door. And just I was just always fascinated by, by uh, business and uh, investments. And I, I, at one time, I think I sort of had an aspiration of being somehow involved in the financial services uh, market. But... Um, you know, on the way to an education, I got sidetracked and my parents sort of recommended that I uh, go into engineering. So I went to Lehigh. My older brother, oldest brother had uh, gone to Lehigh University and that's, you know, where I went to school and graduated from there in 1971. My parents were, uh, I'll say, profoundly impacted by the depression and mm -hmm. living through the 30s and not having money and, you know, str struggling. and. Um, I, th I think they thought that if I went to Lehigh and uh, got a, an engineering degree that I'd always be able to have have sure. a job. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, two things happened magically to me uh, at Lehigh. One was uh, uh, in uh, 1967 when I started at Lehigh as a freshman, uh, Lehigh had been given by a company called Control Data, mm -hmm. a scientific a computer. And it was a 64-bit computer. You know, we revere 64-bit computing today, but all the way back then, control data was making 64-bit uh, computers. And uh, at Lehigh, they taught all the freshmen programming in Fortran mm -hmm. and systems analysis and design, such as the state of the art was at that time, which was remarkable in and of itself. But then they wove computing as a problem-solving tool through the curriculum. So mm -hmm. every year we applied the use of the computer to solve problems. And the two things I often say that I learned in college was that number one, I didn't want to be a, 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 an engineer, a traditional engineer, mm -hmm. but I did want to work with uh, computers. You know, I was one of those computer geeks that spent as much time as I could down in the computer lab. I mean, it sounds, you know, archaic, but at the time, you know, everything was done on 80 column cards. So right. you're sitting in front of an IBM cards, uh, right. uh, 029 or 129 key punch and making 80 column cards and submitting them to process your program. And it came mm -hmm. back in a, your cards would be wrapped up in, you know, with your printout from your, from your program. Um, but it was, it was uh, fascinating and, uh, you know, I already talked about when I got out of college, I went to work for a specialty steel manufacturer called uh, Carpenter and started as an on-the-bench uh, programmer, developer, and I, you know, moved up through the chairs relatively quickly and became uh, a supervisor, and uh, we started building production management systems, and uh, literally we, we made the, among the first uh, online real-time production management systems that were deployed in the steel industry. It was it was fascinating stuff. We had to invent a lot of the the technology, even the uh, the telecommunications monitors that drove the uh, the display devices were custom made mm -hmm. uh, for this. It was before IBM really had uh, telecommunication monitors available for their uh, mainframe equipment. So. Um, so it was, it was fascinating, but uh, as I said, you know, even in, you know, I was always fascinated by, by business, mm -hmm. and in 
college, uh, I, I had to say that you know I, I was m many times more interested in reading the Wall Street Journal or Business Week or mm -hmm. Fortune magazine than I was in uh, going to <laughs> going to class. Of <laughs> quite right, quite right. quite frankly, right. uh, and and on and, and I couldn't. You know, as we got closer to graduation, I really couldn't wait to be finished with uh, college and, and get to work. And I can remember when I first started uh, working at Carpenter, I used to tell my, my friends that I loved my job so much that I couldn't wait for the weekend to be over to go back to work. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, was, it was a joy to me to be able to do what we were, were doing. And, and, and I sort of felt, uh, and, and you know, it, it was odd, but I, I, I felt like I was part of uh, what the the people in the space program must have been part of that were you know trying to put men into mm -hmm. something to, completely to, new to space you know it was completely new we yeah. were braving braving new tra new trails sure. and um, uh, y you know uh, I was uh, probably the the very youngest guy on the mm -hmm. on the on the team which was kind of interesting too an interesting dynamic in the sense that. Um, a lot of the people that I worked with didn't hadn't gone to college. You know, they oh, maybe came they maybe came up in the steel right. business okay. and got an opportunity to sure. bid on a job in mm -hmm. in the IT department and moved into that and sort mm -hmm. of learned right. learned uh, software development. But well, there probably wasn't program. a lot of college graduates coming out with that kind of background. well, well, there 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 there, there weren't, and right. of course uh, in the in industry in general, I, I think at that time, there was a tendency to want to promote from within to oh, sort of sure. grow, sure. grow, grow your own. I guess that was maybe one of the frustrations I have of why I left in the first place. But you're a millennial at heart. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I guess, I guess, or maybe, a, maybe just a, a outside of the box thinker. But but in, in any event, um, that was even contentious. I I, I when uh, when I first got promoted to be a supervisor. I was, of course, uh, in my in my twenties, uh, and um, most of the people that worked for me were older than me, mm -hmm. and um, uh, most of them hadn't gone to college either. So it was um, an interesting dynamic, to, yeah. to, to say the least. We also had uh, on this team a couple of uh, Vietnam vets, okay. and uh, I got to see firsthand some of the impact that uh, the war um, had on those <laughs> those folks and their uh, unfortunate side effects right. actually mm -hmm. um, what we know now is post traumatic stress yeah exa exactly right. but, but we didn't we didn't know yeah, it we didn't mm -hmm. know it at the yeah. at the time and carpenter did a good thing to hire veterans i think uh, some of them really struggled with uh, the, the residual of you know coming back from combat but sure. um, but uh, so th that was a great uh, a great time in in my life, and um, uh, actually that that couldn't wait to the weekend to get over uh, to go back to work. It transitioned, you know, as we got closer to the deployment of this system, that we literally were working almost twenty four hours a day, <laughs> seven, mm -hmm. seven there days. There were no yeah. weekends. There, there right. weren't any weekends <laughs> because we you know we were up against deadlines to deploy the system. We were working hard to. You know, get the last uh, bugs out of the uh, of the the system. You know, also uh, uh, back in sort of the olden days of of computing, you had to do your testing sort of at night uh, and on the weekends mm -hmm. when the production work wasn't happening. Right, so right. we'd be coding all day, and then we could get the systems from usually about uh, one a.m. In the morning until sure. 6 a.m. in in the morning. Take that downtime, and we, so we would take yeah. that downtime to test our yeah. to test our programs. Mm -hmm. I can still remember. In fact, I had a flashback uh, last night. I was out to dinner with my grandchildren, and the song uh, "American Pie," mm -hmm. uh, you know, "Bye Bye Miss yeah, American yeah, Pie." Sure. I know, sure. that, be lovey, right? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, no, no. That, that's not the song I'm talking about. Or, or is it? Um, it's the Don McLean yeah, yeah, that's song. Okay, that's right. it. Yeah. Uh, the day the music died yeah, yes. the is, the, is the name. Die, yeah. Is the name of the song, and that song was on the radio <laughs> playing constantly. Uh -huh. and so, the top so, ten or whatever. Yeah. Like so every. so when I hear that when I hear that song, I think of Fits being being back. in that computer room right. in the basement of that of that right, building right. rather than 
you know, the, the passing of three, <laughs> three musicians. Well, you must have looked back on that time, though. I mean, that's the kind of energy and passion you need to start your own business, right? I mean, if you were anxious to look for the weekends and the downtime, then you're an employee. If you're not, you're working and you're passionate, that, that's, that's engineer, right. that's entrepreneurial energy. Yeah. It, I mean, you must have taken that into, into the business when you started it. I, I, I did. I, you know, I think that um, I kind of always knew that being an entrepreneur was in my future. Or, or I, I, I don't think I thought it, I didn't use that term, but, you know, I, I, I wanted to be uh, an executive and a founder of uh, of a small business, and uh, I mean, even uh, I, 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 when when I uh, worked for uh, Ernst and Young, e even though I was pretty much a, a technology consultant, I mean that was largely what I did in the the four years I was there. I uh, engineered my way to get involved in the merger and acquisition team there uh, and you know uh, doing uh, analysis on the buying and selling of, uh, of businesses uh, but also uh, I got involved in the process of uh, in auditing a bank one of the things that uh, happens is you uh, review the adequacy of the loan loss reserve mm -hmm. so having an opportunity to uh, be part of that process I got to see the inside of how uh, the financials of companies worked, you know, particularly yeah. troubled, troubled companies. Mm -hmm. And I found I, f I really found that absolutely fascinating uh, in terms of helping me understand, you know, what steps uh, companies had taken that got right. them into tremendous business in, lesson in, 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 right. into trouble. Maintaining uh, cash and, and it, things that companies don't do well that allows them to fall. Exactly, and, and taking on uh, inordinate amounts of uh, of, of risk. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know that that, that may actually have uh, been a lesson to me that yeah. you know uh, that that maybe stunted the growth of White and Hammer <laughs> over the years. Is yeah. that I've been more we've been more risk averse perhaps than. Uh, than we should be, but uh, you know, in February, Wyden Hammer will celebrate 40 years in in uh, in business, and you know, as you might imagine, there aren't many uh, technology companies that really uh, achieve that. Sure, that, not many that, companies. That, that it's a very small no, percentage right. of companies it, reach that kind of milestone. That's fantastic. It, 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 there are a few that that uh, achieve that milestone, and uh, you know, I'm hoping that I can position what we've built. You know, together, so that there's another 40, 40 years. Right. In fact, I, I, I think that if things work out the way I would like, that my legacy would be that we can be uh, an intergenerational business. So I mean, mean not meaning my that my mm -hmm. family would sure. continue right. to run the business, but that the next generation of leaders and managers at Widenhammer could take over the business when I'm hopefully retired in Florida right. or some other exotic place. <laughs> uh, not that Florida is that exotic, but some, some, <laughs> some, some warm, warm some, that's yeah, right. Exactly, yeah, and, and of course, as it starts to right. get colder here, you know, you start thinking about going south, at least I do. Uh, but but in, in, in any event, um, you know, I'd like my legacy to be that we transitioned Widenhammer to a next generation of leaders and managers right. and they're able to take the business to the, to the next level, so. Uh, I spend a lot of time, you know, doing that and really mm -hmm. getting that next generation yeah. ready to run run the business. Uh, that's a great. That's that's a phenomenal accomplishment, yeah. John. This has been great, and the time has flown. I feel like we could, you know, talk another hour. Well, here let's do it. Come on, <laughs> keep, the, keep right. the tape rolling, <laughs> would you please? So, thank you again uh, for taking time uh, to today to talk to us and, and share a little insight. Would love to see if we could have you back at some time. Pick up the story where we left off. I know there's some exciting things that. Um, where technology is going and some of the things on the horizon. We'd love to get your insight in on at, at some point. So um, uh, the next guest for the Money Matters TV program will be uh, Roy Anella of Wealth Advocate uh, Investment Group. As a reminder, you can download the podcast from iTunes and Stitcher and watch our videos on YouTube. Thank you for joining us for Growth Stories. <laughs>